All right, there we go. Welcome, everybody. Good morning, Eagle Creek. Yeah. Welcome. So glad that you guys are here this morning. I uh, want to apologize. We did not uh, let you guys know ahead of time, but we are having communion this morning. So for those at home, want to give you this opportunity while we are singing our couple songs to grab that uh, juice and bread. If you don't have it at home, don't worry. Like You can still uh, remember the Lord um, during that time and give thanks to Him. For you people here, if you didn't see already underneath your seats are your little bread and cup uh, of juice uh, to take at that time when we have that. So how about um, we pray and have you guys uh, go ahead and stand. Father, thank you for this morning um, to be here for you. We are here for you, Lord, to praise your name, to worship you, to hear from you, Lord, this morning, and to apply what we, Lord, uh, what we have heard from you, Lord, and to be um, transformed in the renewing of our mind as we hear your holy scripture, Lord, and hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, it says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. In Psalm 103, 13, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. All right, would you stand? No, we're all searching. 
possible to be making us right before our Father and giving us that spirit. Thank you, Father, for giving us the spirit that cries out to you, Abba, Father, you as our Father, you as our good, good Father, that every good and perfect gift comes from you, Lord. You are a Father who lavishes upon us, who is so loving, so generous, so good, Lord. So help us as children to see that and give praise and glory to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. 
sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. You can go ahead and have a seat. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. Um, my name is Leah Redden, and I'm kind of in charge this year of coordinating and putting together the Easter egg hunt that our church is going to host for the community. We are all very excited about it. This year, April, April 4th is Easter. It's a little early. So we are going to plan our community Easter egg hunt for the Saturday before, April 3rd. We are hoping for a good turnout. Talking to my parents, we're going to plan on roughly 200 kids showing up. We have no idea if that number is accurate, but that's what we are going to plan on, which means we need roughly 2,000 stuffed eggs, which is a lot of eggs. <laughs> um, and that's a lot of candy. and. That's a lot. So I'm asking for your help. We have decided to mix the eggs this year. We're going to try and put money in some of the eggs, like nickels, dimes, quarters, whatever, maybe a couple $1 bills. And then we're also going to put chocolate and other type of candy in the other eggs. So we are asking for donations from you guys to please donate candy, if you have coins just laying around, if you guys wouldn't mind donating that as well. Um, if you want to make out a check, that's fine. Just put it in the memo that it's for the Easter egg hunt. So we do appreciate that. We also need, oh, the candy. It has to be individually wrapped, right? Like you can't just buy a bag of jelly beans and we can't disperse that into the eggs, right? We're trying to be COVID aware. <laughs> So if you can make sure that the chocolate or the whatever you're going to buy is all individually wrapped already and that it will fit in your normal sized egg, please. On top of that, we do need lots of volunteers. We're going to need people for many different activities and just to be there on that day. The time is from, I think it's like from 1.30 is registration. Kickoff is going to be about 2 and then kind of just until whenever it ends, probably 3-ish, 3 3.30-ish. 3 so we, I am asking for you guys to think about that day, see if you're available. Next week I am going to have a sign-up sheet so that I can start getting an idea of how many people are able to volunteer. We will have different jobs. We're hoping to have snacks to give out. We're hoping to have some games. Uh, we're hoping to have a craft station. We're going to be doing a raffle, so we're going to have... Um, We'll need people to get the raffle tickets and that information out. And then we are hoping to have some people just out in the field during the hunt to kind of direct kids of where not to go, like don't go near the road or don't go into the woods, right? Um, so yeah. And then also think, be thinking about, I don't have a date yet, but sometime that week prior to this hunt, I'm going to have a either a Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon, something of a huge Easter egg stuffing day, <laughs> where I'm asking for people to please come to the church and help me stuff 2,000 eggs, because that's a lot of eggs. <laughs> um, so these are just things that I want you guys to be thinking about. Um, it is coming up. Easter is not at the end of April. It is at the beginning, so it's soon. And I wanted to get this all in your mind now. So yes, next week, hopefully I'll have an idea of roughly how many volunteers I'll need, and I hope to have a sign-out sheet. And then... If you have donations, I don't know, will we have a box somewhere they can put them? Yeah, we'll have a box or something in the foyer that you guys can put donations starting next week. So we're still planning it, but that is just to give you an idea of what we have planned and what's going to be going on. So thank you. And that is all I have today. Good morning, church. So uh, it is a great privilege to be here this morning and to uh, uh, worship the Lord and to uh, have uh, to fellowship with one another. It is uh, 
it is an awesome privilege. We want to welcome you, each and every one of you, and we also want to welcome those who are online with us and watching online. We don't want to forget about you. Um, we appreciate this opportunity again to, uh, to be here. As I have been um, um, thinking about um, the Lord's Supper, as you know, we are here to uh, partake in the Lord's Supper as well. I have been, uh, as, I, as I have been uh, thinking about it, there is a question that came to my mind. Maybe it might be uh, of interest to you. It is that, what do I want to be remembered for when I die? I'm sure you have heard that question before, but I'm just asking, I ask myself, what, what do I want to be remembered for when I die? And when I was asking that question myself, that question, and I, I even go and asking some of the world, for some of the famous people, he said, if I were to ask them, you know, what they want to be remembered for, what they would answer me, what the answer would be, you know, I know, we know, as we know, and there are some athletes out there, and they book records, they have a lot of things, and some politicians, they've set, and architects, there are so many people that have set the record, and even in football, in basketball, some of them, you know, they just set records, and they, maybe that's what they want to be remembered for, you know, when they die, and we just had one, I don't know if you're a fan of Tom Brady, but he just broke another record. Uh, uh, it's, it's amazing, you know, what people can do and, and what they want to be remembered for. And I ask myself, what, what do I want to be remembered for? And even you today, you probably, each one of you, you know, you would have an answer, different answers. But this morning, uh, as we all get ready to prepare our heart and mind to partake in the Lord's Supper, and I uh, would like to ask this question, what Jesus wants to be remembered for? And what does he want to be remembered for? And the answer could be simple, but it is profound, yet profound. Jesus today, he just wants you to remember that he paid the price for you. He did it for you. And by his blood, his mercy and grace, you are here today just because of the sacrifice that he did on your behalf. He wants to be remembered for that. There's a song that came to mind. I don't know if you know that song. It says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. When Jesus was on the cross, you were on his mind. He was thinking about you. So today, I'd invite you and those of you online, as you are partaking in this supper, and as Jay already told you, you would get the cup, and you have a moment to think about it, to think about your life, and not to participate in this, not to enjoy not only this moment, but to see if, ask the Lord to help you to make it a lifestyle for you. Every day you wake up, you remember, you would remember this sacrifice that was done a long time ago on your behalf. I'm gonna be singing a song and uh, you can uh, start uh, taking the cup, and after that, you'll have a little moment of silence too, and you can take it uh, when you're ready. As I'm singing this old song, well, relatively old song, and I'm asking the Lord to help you. But before doing so, I'm going to ask you to uh, uh, read uh, with me or follow along with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And this is where we're going to read that passage of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, and we're going to read that very quickly. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass unto you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me.
For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I'll repeat the last uh, verse. It says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. By your head, Lord God, I pray today that you'll help us. Help us to become more like you. We need your help, Lord. We cannot do it in our own. Lord God, we love you. We worship you with all our heart. We don't want to do this as a routine. We don't want to just do it because you want to show off. It would not have been of any significance. We want to do it because we believe in it. We want to honor you. We want to show you how much we love you. And remember the sacrifice that you've done for us. Please help us today to live by it and to continue to do our part. But with your help, we know you will help us achieve this ultimate goal, which is to be with you one day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
You ever feel inadequate? I play guitar. That man is an artist. Thank you so much, Keely, for your words. Um, good gracious. Well, we're so glad you're here this morning. We're so glad that we were able to celebrate the Lord's death and resurrection, his body and bro broken and his blood poured out for us. So glad to see all of you here this morning. And I'm also so glad that for the first time in months and months, I get to say, hey kids, you're dismissed to go to Sunday school. <laughs> What's that? Uh, Penny has something for me real quick. What's... Okay, great. See, Penny, for hand sanitizer. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, praise God for that. And thank you to all the folks that uh, volunteered to help get that back going. I know um, those of us with small kids appreciate it greatly. All right. Well, this morning, we're starting a new series. Um, you know, we... When we come up towards Christmas, we spend four weeks kind of prepping for it. We call that Advent. There's not really a neat name for, I guess Lent, but um, it's not really a neat name for the Advent season for Easter. What we thought we'd do is, why don't we take a look at what is this, what is this holiday that we are about to celebrate? Why don't we pray and then we'll dive in. Father God, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for those who are here in person. Um, it's wonderful to see every smiling face. Lord God, thank you for those who are watching online. We pray that your word would go out everywhere. Lord, we, we pray for those who are in other churches worshiping you this morning, that your name would be glorified. And we thank you that this morning already your name has been glorified. We want to hear from you. We want to be taught by you. And Lord, we want to just raise you up and praise you for who you are. It's in your name we pray these things. Amen. So the first question I have is, what's Easter anyway? First thing it is, is, well, you know, we talk about the Easter egg hunts. Proof your kids can find things if they really want to. can't imagine how many times I've said, hey, go find your stuffed animals. I can't find it. Did you turn around? That's where it was. All right. No, what really is Easter? Well, here are some thoughts. Is it one of the two days Americans attend church every year? Is it a holiday to spend with the family? Is it a time for chocolate bunnies and jelly beans? Especially Starburst jelly beans. This is not a sponsored sermon. Um, is it a time to die, hunt, and hide eggs? A time for ham and lamb and cakes and mint jelly? It's what it's become, right? Just a corporate commercial holiday. Got a question. What percentage of Americans do you think could tell you the real meaning of Easter? Ballpark it. Give me an idea. Five, six, ten, one percent. According to the Barna Group, in a 2010 survey, 42 percent knew that it was about Christ's death and resurrection. That kind of surprised me. However, when I got to think about it, that means almost six out of ten people that you see on the road have no idea that Jesus is involved in Easter. The same survey I read said that only 2% of American adults believe that Easter is the most important holiday of the year. You catch that? 2%. So why, why are we doing this? Well, because I believe that for at least this church, it should be 100% that believe Easter is the most important holiday. 
So as we look over this the next five weeks, here's what we're going to do. Today we're going to talk about the need for Easter. Why did Christ have to come and die? Next week, we'll talk about changed lives. What it looks like when we've accepted that. The third week, we'll talk about what will you do with Christ? Whether it means accepting him for the first time or living life with him afterwards. Just before Easter, we'll talk about the fact that it is finished. And finally, we'll get to talk about the blessings of Easter on Resurrection Sunday. But I get the fun part, or not so fun part, of talking about why we even need Easter. Turn me, if we will, to Genesis. We're going to start at the beginning. It's a good place to start, I think. We're going to be looking at chapter 3 in depth here. But I want to give you the context right before that. In Genesis 2, 15 through 17, it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Okay? So that's the context that we go into this next section with. Read along with me. I'm in the ESV. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, continuing in verse 4, You won't surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So, when the woman saw that, it was, that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. So how did sin enter the world? How did sin enter the world? God gave us a commandment. We had one job. Don't eat from that tree. It's to note that the other commandment to be fruitful and multiply wasn't a problem. So how did it enter? Well, the serpent played fast and loose with definitions. He inserted seeds of doubt. And instead of asking God for clarification or help, Adam and Eve made some decisions on their own. They listened to Satan. They listened to their own desires rather than the sure word of God. What does it say? It was pleasing to the eyes and desirable for wisdom. So they went, hey, this is good for me. I'm going to take it. Not only that, doubt crept in. They were convinced that God was holding out on them. Hey, this is a great thing. You should take it. God told you you can't? Well, that's because he doesn't have your best at heart. They wanted to be like God, but only because they were convinced they were missing out. They were convinced that their own plan was better than God's plan. Again, instead of asking for clarification, they said, we got this. How else did sin enter the world? Well, you know, a lot of people wrongly place all the blame on Eve for disobeying God. You ever heard that? Um, they forget one important phrase in this passage. Also, yeah, laugh about it. Adam and Eve didn't uh, read the Apple Terms and Conditions. Um, I thought that was funny. It's cute. Anyway, they forget this one thing. Adam was with her. 
He saw the whole thing. My understanding is he, he watched the serpent talk to her. Backing up to Genesis 2, who did God give that command to? He gave it to Adam. He gave it directly to Adam. And Eve hadn't even been created at this point. So in the verses following, in chapter 3, God calls Adam to account for his sin. They're both at fault here. Adam and Eve were both making a conscious choice to sin. They ignored the word of God, and they instead focused on elevating themselves. And then Adam chose sin and Eve over God. Verses 8 forward, God calls Adam to account for that sin. He says, where are you? Adam says, I heard you coming and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Uh Uh-oh. God says, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? So what's Adam do? He stands up, takes it like a man and says, I was wrong. I didn't, nope. Notice what he does. He says, the woman who you gave to me. Now, hold on a second, Adam. He blames Eve, the woman. Then he blames God for even giving her the woman. She gave me the fruit and I ate. Look at the way he tries to weasel out of this. Adam blames Eve then blames God. So God says, okay, Eve, what have, what's this that you've done? She says, the serpent deceived me and I ate. She blames the serpent. Neither of them take responsibility for their choice, but both of them are culpable for their sin. So again, it's not just Eve's fault that we have sin. Adam is equally, if not more so, culpable. Maybe we should back up a second. What is sin? You might be asking yourself. I hope not in here, but you might be. You know, sin is giving in to any thought, action, or desire contrary to God's law. At that point, the only law that we really had was don't eat from the tree. They broke it. But the repercussions of sin are great and wide-ranging. What happened? Well, Adam and Eve ran from what they'd done. They refused to take responsibility. And for the first time, they felt a loss of innocence. They felt shame. They felt guilt. They felt exposure both physically and spiritually. Verse 3 8 says, They hid themselves. They had no reason to hide ever before. They knew something was wrong. They didn't want to face it, and they hid from God. That was the short-term consequences. Let's look at the long-term consequences of what sin entering the world has done. First, separation from God. They were kicked out of the garden and could no longer enjoy that face-to-face relationship they had. The word says that God used to walk through the garden with them. He spent time with them, with Adam naming the animals. and God used to walk through the garden and just enjoy what he'd done. That ended. It also resulted in physical trouble, difficulty in working, and pain in childbearing. Result in enmity between husband and wife, sometimes being at cross purposes. ends in physical death, just like God said. Satan trying to trick Eve on a technicality, but God wasn't lying. It's just what the serpent question. You know, God's not a liar like Satan is. Satan twisted the idea. He reframed the narrative 
to make it seem like God wasn't being honest and didn't have their best at heart. It resulted not only in physical death, though, the removal of the tree of life from their easy access, but ultimately spiritual death. Permanent separation from God. So just as Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and thereby sin entered the world, we all now have this sin nature in us. It's built in where we're given the choice of whether to follow God or ourselves, but invariably we choose ourselves. We choose our sin. We choose our plans, resulting in being lost and separated from God for all eternity because of our sin. It's a pretty harrowing thought. But even at the beginning, even with this catastrophic breaking of the relationship we had with God at the beginning, his provision was still there. We see his mercy and grace taking root even at the very beginning. Genesis 3, 15, second half of the verse says, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. God's talking to the serpent there saying that Christ is going to come someday and he's going to crush what you've done even though he's going to be hurt in the process. So even from the beginning, God had a plan to rectify the sin caused by abandoning his perfect plan and choosing ourselves and our doubts and our sin over him. We also see that in God's love for his people, he still provided, even after they'd broken a relationship, even for their physical needs. He made a cover for their shame. It says in verse 321, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. He made a cover for their shame, made of skins, and we see that blood had to be shed in order to make right something that had been ruined by sin. This is both a foreshadowing of what would happen in Christ as well as a short-term solution to their nakedness and newly minted exposure to a harsh and unforgiving world corrupted and tainted by sin. Even though they were removed from the garden, God's provision still followed Adam and Eve. All right, so I know the next question is, what's this got to do with me? Well, Paul doesn't mince any words. In Romans 3.23, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us. We have the same repercussions for sin. When we choose to turn away from God, when we choose our own way, when we choose our sin over him, we run into the same thing Adam and Eve did. We try to run away from that sin. We experience the same loss of innocence. We feel the same shame, the same guilt, the same exposure that they felt. And we come up with ever more elaborate ways of covering up the crippling effects of sin. Only this time, instead of fig leaves sewn together, what do we do? We turn to jobs, relationships, our status, drugs, hobbies, money, politics, music, whatever we can put on the outside to cover up what's missing inside. I want you to note that none of those things is wrong in its proper context. None of those things are wrong in the proper usage. But every time we put something in God's place, we sin. And that sin separates from God, both in a here and now sense, because it's harder to hear from him, and surrounds us day in and day out, but also in the eternal sense. It makes us sinners. We're not good people. No one's good. We're sinners who cannot be in God's presence because it's the same thing as light and darkness. If you turn on a light 
in a dark room, where does the darkness go? They can't exist in the same place at the same time. In the same way, God's goodness and holiness and perfectness doesn't allow for sin to be near it. And yet, he calls out to us, doesn't he? Even in the darkest night of sin, he calls out. He gives us good things to remind us that he's here. But sin so often overtakes them. We feel the guilt and shame of sin when we turn from him, but it's so easy to come up with excuses or justifications or just add more and more sin to try and cover up and push down what we can't hide. It adds up and it adds up and it adds up and it doesn't get better. Every time it hurts more and more. It ruins relationships more. It ruins reputations faster. It crushes hopes and dreams because we find out that all these things we're trying to look to instead of following God result in that very death he warned us about in Genesis 2. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. What does this mean? Well, we're hurting. Aren't we? We can put on a face sometimes and, and put on a mask, pardon the pun. But this pandemic has only brought to light what was already there under the surface. Pandemic didn't cause domestic violence. It just allowed for it more. Domestic violence has skyrocketed. Depression and mental health issues and suicide have increased so quickly these last months. And the constant pain and oppression we feel show us there's something wrong here. God's given us that ability to recognize suffering so that we can use that knowledge to say, this is not right. It shouldn't be this way. Something, something needs to change. And eventually we get to the point we realize that nothing we ourselves can do will cause that change. No amount of diversion, no amount of idolatry, putting things in God's place, no amount of running away from our sin will ever solve the problem. The Bible puts it this way. In the first half of 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, because we are all of the lineage of Adam, Born into sin and sinners ourselves, we will die. Romans 6.23a puts it this way, the wages of sin is death. Wages are someone's just payment, what they deserve. So the just payment for our efforts, for our sin, is death. Physical now and eternal forever. We all get exactly what we deserve because we've all sinned against a holy God. But back up, isn't this supposed to be a, an uplifting message? What's Easter got to do with all this? Now that I've told you about the need, I want to tell you about how God provides for it. Paul lays it out to us in his letter to the Romans. Romans 5.8 it says, But God shows his love for us, and that we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He loves us so much, and he wants that relationship with us so much that he died for us while we were still sinners. Irrespective of whether we choose him, irrespective of whether we lived up to his standards, he still loved us. He still died for us to provide that way out. Remember Romans 3.23? It says, all have sinned and fallen short of his glory. What's Christ's solution? What's his cure for this pandemic of sin? Romans 3.24 says, And are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. All sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace. 
That's the solution that Christ provides. That's what we're looking forward to. That's why Easter should be the most important holiday of the year. Because brothers and sisters, if Christ didn't die and come back from the dead, we're still in our sin. And there is no way out. God put him forth as a propitiation by his blood. That word propitiation, we see that a couple times in the scripture. What's it mean? It means the atonement. It means the act of pleasing God. What, what satisfied the demands of the law and paid that blood debt of sin that we built up? It's to be received by faith. When we place our faith in Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection as the only payment for our sins and the only way to be right with God, we're justified by his grace. You know, I had a conversation with a coworker, and uh, I asked the diagnostic questions. Those are some of my favorite questions to ask. You know, if, uh, if you were to die today, why would God let you in? She looked at me, oh, well, I don't think you should. That's a good spot to be. Right? Because most of the time, actually probably 99% of the time, people tell me, I'm a pretty good person. You've probably heard me say this before, but you know, a lot of people look at themselves on this uh, spectrum of humanity where right here, we've got Adolf Hitler, and right here, we've got Mother Teresa. And, and most people are like, I, I, I didn't kill anybody, so I'm probably closer to Mother I'm not as good as Mother Teresa, but I'm probably on that side of things. And they go, you know, I'm probably better than average on a human standpoint. Well, that's great. Okay, so you're like um, 12 inches from Hitler. <laughs> awesome. You know what the problem with that is? God is 475 miles that way. He's so far outside of what our concept of good and evil is in his holiness that we'll never measure up. Never measure up. But when we place our faith in Christ, we get the imputed righteousness of Jesus who was perfect, who did live the perfect life we were supposed to live in our place and willingly went to that cross, dying the death we by all rights deserve. It's the only way, the only answer God will accept if he asks us, why should I let you in? It's because of the blood of your son. He passed over former sins, it says. Just as he passed over the houses of Israel in Egypt, and he saw the blood of the lambs on the doorposts, and he knew in here is a family that obeys my word. So too now when he looks at us, he sees the blood of the lamb, his very son. And we're saved from his fully deserved wrath by trusting in what he's done. Back to those verses. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. I'm so glad it doesn't end at just for as in all, Adam all die. It says, so in Christ, Christ all will be made alive. What's important about that is the in Christ. It doesn't just say, for as an Adam all die, so all will be made alive. Not everybody will be made alive, only those who are in Christ. Romans 6.23 doesn't stop it, just the wages of sin is death. It says, but, and that's a good but, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise be to God that he's made a way out. You know, this is what Easter is all about. I might have shared this story before. One of the best examples I've seen in my life of that kind of sacrificial love, of what Christ-like love looks like is, when I was a little kid, still living in Texas, oh, probably four maybe three, four, something like that. My dad left his nice Citizen Quartz watch out on the uh, kitchen counter. Next to that was a bell that my older brother had. It was kind of a neat bell. How did you make that bell make noise? Well, there was a little brass hammer sitting next to 
that bell. And I picked up that hammer and I thought, hmm, that watch looks like something I should hit with this hammer. <laughs> as you do as a four-year-old. So I tapped it and it cracked and I was like, that's cool. So I kept going. And I blasted through all of the, the glass in that little watch. And then I realized, Dad's not going to be super happy when he sees what I've done. So I got, I had to fix it. I had to cover it up. So my fig leaves were um, scotch tape. <laughs> <laughs> and I grabbed the scotch tape and I put it over the top of this thing. And... Um, Good as new, Dad, you won't notice. Well, he, he noticed. But my dad instilled the best example of what Christ-like love is. He didn't get mad at me. He asked me what I'd done. He's like, okay. We went to the store, and he took me with him to get that repaired, and he showed me what it cost him to do that. That's what Easter's all about what it cost God to repair what we'd broken. So how do we get that restoration? How can we be restored? Paul lays it out in Romans 10. He says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. God has made provision for anyone who would come to him to be saved. He died on the cross to save the whole world from their sin because he loves us so much. The one requirement is that we turn from our sin, confess, which means to agree with God that it is sin, and believe in Jesus, his son, whose death and resurrection paid the debt we've been building our entire lives through sin. If you've made that choice, wonderful Bring as many people you can, as you can with you. Invite them to church. It's, there's never, there has absolutely never been an easier time to invite someone to church because they don't even have to come to the building to see what we're talking about. If you haven't made that choice, today's the day. Today's the day to be honest with yourself and to be honest with God and agree with him that you're a sinner. And place your trust in him. What an amazing God we have who wouldn't require us to pay our own way, but in his love and forbearance provided payment if we would only turn and follow him. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your great love. We thank you so much for your great provision. We thank you so much that even though our sin made us scarlet. You've washed us white as snow through your blood. How wonderful and paradoxical it is that by pouring your blood on us, we become clean. And Father God, we just ask that as we come towards this Resurrection Sunday, that we would put, we'd put that day where it belongs as the most important holiday because it tells us how much you loved us and what it cost you to repair that relationship we broke. We love you and we praise you. It's in your name and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, um, our last song today, just thought it appropriate in a world that is very disunified right now, um, and I appreciate this morning's message, uh, just as Christians, that we can rejoice in the greatest holiday in Christ's uh, death and resurrection, that we declare in this song, this is a song of declaration who God is, who we believe as Christians, and that we can celebrate and tell the world um, and be those messengers of who God is. So uh, let's stand and sing our last song together.
1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Father, thank you that all of this is possible because of you. Lord, thank you that you showed us grace when we didn't deserve it, Lord. At the moment of the garden and even in our lives here today in the present, Lord, how you've shown us an abundance of grace, Lord, and we just give you thanks and just help us to rejoice, help us to have joy, Lord, 
in Easter and that you didn't stay in that grave, Lord. Hallelujah, that you rose from the grave. We believe in the crucifixion, but we also believe in that resurrection and that one day you're going to come back and take us home with you for all eternity. We rejoice in that. And I too pray, Lord, that anyone who has not received that gift today, that today would be the day of salvation, that they would respond, that as their ears hear the message, that they would not neglect it, but accept it, your free gift of eternal grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.